You're looking incredibly sharp. Make sure the camera gets all the way down here. Some, this is quite a get up. I got you, man. Hey, I can get you a discount. First of all, I appreciate you taking some time to speak with me again. I think this is uh, fifth year. Right. Fifth year since I was drafted and also our fourth consecutive year as you, with you as commissioner, standing commissioner. It's become part of our tradition. Let's get right into it. It's been a, a bit of a theme this year with DeMar DeRozan coming out and speaking, Kevin Love coming out and speaking about mental health and the importance of understanding how to deal with you know, stress, anxiety. How can players become more comfortable with coming forward uh, with certain issues they may be going through? Well, uh, you know, I'll begin by saying um, hats off to Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan for their willingness to speak openly about these issues. I think you and I know even when we started these interviews five years ago, that wasn't something players were willing to do. And I think right. the fact that two all-star caliber players are willing to talk about those kinds of issues, mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, anxiety, depression, stress, all the things that go with being an NBA player, but frankly just go with being a human being. But when guys won't talk about it, I think they're reluctant to ask for help as well. Right. So I think that's the first step to just to openly talk about it. Obviously we have some very young adults in this league and they may not even understand it themselves. They may not realize it's a mental health issue. So we need to train the, the, the people associated with the team to recognize those issues, that when guys are suffering for whatever reason, that they let them know that there's help they can get from the team or privately. And in fact, I was talking to Michelle Roberts, executive director of, of the Players Association. They are also putting in place a state-of-the-art program um, so that if for some reason a player isn't comfortable talking to his team directly isn't comfortable dealing with the league, you can go right to the Players Association and they'll have an independent program which is kept private. I think the other issue involved in this um, is there a notion that somehow it will hurt a player's career and I think it's the exact opposite. I think because to the extent what players are seeing is when you can get a handle on dealing with stress, anxiety, or you know, depression, whatever the ailments are, mm -hmm. you're gonna be a better player. And lastly, it's a wonderful message to our fans, especially our young fans, that right. um, when they're dealing with mental health issues, there's not a stigma. That you know, you, it's okay to go to a teacher, a coach, a parent, a friend, and say, I'm having difficulty dealing with these issues. Um, is there someone out there that can help me? Becky Hammond is someone who's done a lot of stuff for the NBA and WNBA and world in general. She's obviously, you know, been in a position to be one of the first females interviewed for a head coaching position. So I have to ask, you know, your thoughts on the NBA as far as being ahead on the diversity issues that some of the other leagues may face. I'm incredibly proud of Becky. I knew her when she was a WNBA player as well, and I have no doubt that she's on a track to be a head coach in this league. And um, in terms of other diverse candidates, I think we're doing a pretty good job. I mean, but there's always room for improvement. I think one of the things that we at the league can do a better job on is training the up and coming next generation of general managers. So we created a program at the league office so that former players, WNBA players too are in that program, can get that training at, and we can create a pool of candidates. I'm proud of what's happening right now in the league, but I, I think we're, we're just scratching the surface. And by the way, we only have one active woman official right now. We brought in a woman named Michelle Johnson to oversee our officiating program. Part of her job is to create a more diverse pool. So there, that's another area that we're very focused on. I think that the referees have a very, very tough job. Split seconds, and we feel like we're fouled. Sometimes we're not. We've lost a couple games this season on reviews at the end of the, at the, end of the game. So at what point will you be allowed to look at the entire play? During review, during review, and is that something you guys have kind of, you know, looked at or discussed? It's a great question. It, it's tough to find the right balance when you're looking at replay. The old, old other issue becomes how far back do you go? Right. You know, so because we hear that all the time, they'll look and say, "Well, yes, under replay, you can see that his foot was on the line, but um, he was fouled. But right before he was fouled, um, another player was fouled." I think at the end of the day, we should err on. Maybe it's surprising for me, but less replay. It's a game of flow. It's inevitable that officials are going to get some calls wrong. And I think that when you balance that against the flow of the game, at some point, I think we just have to accept that. It's part of the game. There's going to be human error. Looking at sports gambling, that's something that was instituted recently uh, according to the Supreme Court ruling. And one of my Twitter followers, I did I put out a, a poll for Twitter to get some fans involved with the uh, interview as well. They asked what relationship the league will have with gambling and will it differ state to state? And then my question personally was regarding the uh, BRI, how that will affect the BRI. My preference was that 
we would replace the existing law that was struck down by the Supreme Court with a new federal law that would have had a consistent regulation from state to state. What the Supreme Court done, has done now is by knocking down the current federal law and Congress not stepping in to replace it with a new law, right. we now are going to have this hodgepodge of regulations mm -hmm. from state to state. And I think you can tell just by virtue of my using the word hodgepodge, I don't think that's something that's in the interest of the league. Having said that, I mean, I'm still in favor of legalized sports betting. I think it's it'll be additive to the league. I think that we know right now that there's many hundreds of billions of dollars bet in the U.S. illegally on sports, and it'll all go into BRI. I mean, it's part of our, in essence, 50-50 split with, with your Players Association. I mean, that's revenue directly associated to the playing the game of basketball. Whatever money comes in as a result will be part of our partnership with the players. You know, in light of what's going on in America right now, it's, it's only right that I bring up the, the situation about the White House uh, disinvitation. I think this may be the first time that it's ever happened in sports, so I have to ask the importance of people like Steve Kerr, Coach Popovich, Braun, Steph, kind of speaking out and using the platform they have in place. I'll begin by saying I'm really proud of all of these members of the NBA community who are speaking out on issues that are important to them. In terms of the White House invitation, I was saddened by it. We have a very divided country right now, and I'd only say I look back to sports to, say, to see how we can do even more to build bridges. I've talked to many players about this, and it's important, I think, that they feel comfortable and, and safe, frankly, in their jobs, knowing that that type of political expression is encouraged. When you look back to, in the history of this league, it's part of the DNA. As always, I appreciate you taking some time with us. Thank you. Thank you, CJ.